I got terribly depressed and was really ready to pack up and, and go back to the States and tell my husband to have a nice time in France. I was going into a new chapter of my life and uh, I was very scared of being alone. I just want to forget what happened in the war. We thought we spoke French, but we didn't speak French. We thought we knew what we were doing, but we didn't know what we were doing at all. I was definitely looking for a family to belong to, a Christian family to belong to. We experienced a couple of deaths in, in the family, and the church was there for us, and we really needed that. I think that everybody's looking for something more deep and more profound. But when I first came to Paris in January of 2004 uh, to live here, I found it to be very different than I expected it to be. I had visited Paris as a tourist a couple of times and loved visiting Paris. It's a fabulous city. But when you live here, it's just different than being a tourist. You have to deal with everyday things. Culture shock sets in, and the culture shock, I think, was much harder than I expected it to be. I thought French people, Western Europeans, are really not that much different than Americans in the way they do things. I think as people, they're not so different, but their way of life is different. Allez, deux poules à fermier d'Iron, mesdames, allez, allez, un petit coup d'œil Allez, à table, deux poules à fermier d'Iron Allez, on termine, mesdames, deux poules à dix, deux poules à dix So my first few months here were very difficult. I stayed in my apartment a lot. I was afraid to go out. I didn't have any friends. I didn't want to go out and speak to French people because I was embarrassed because I couldn't communicate well. I got terribly depressed and was really ready to pack up and, and go back to the States and tell my husband to have a nice time in France. And I really think going to Bloom where you planted that first time saved my marriage. I'm not sure my husband realizes that, but I think it did. Bloom Where You Plant is started by the women of the American church in 1970 when they discovered that many women were coming here with their husbands as expats for the husband's job. Uh, the husbands went happily off to work, the children went happily off to school, and the wife sat at home in her apartment and went a little bit crazy. These women had nothing, and some of them little, literally ended up in mental institutions because they became so badly depressed. So the women's group here at the church decided to develop a program that would help them, help get them out of the house, help them understand things. Even simple things like going to the supermarket here can be quite different because we can't find the products we're used to. Just going to the grocery store, going to the bank is a huge deal here. And then walking through doors and hearing laughing, friendly American voices who say we've been there we've done that we know how you feel and you know we're here to help you and to support you so a severe asthma attack you would call 18 okay severe bleeding hemorrhaging you would call 18 if you're confused about whether to call 15 or 18 it doesn't matter you can call either one and they will send the service to your house we have people talk about cultural adaptation understanding cultural differences and and how to to get through them and overcome them and accept the new culture. Uh, we usually try to have speakers about health care, some practical issues, things to do with children. 
And then we have some workshops on fashion and food and wine. And check for the vintage, the millésime, the right one. Then, if it's okay, interesting. Well, there's a lot of fruit, ex exactly, because it's a young wine. So there's a lot of fruit, and, and what kind of fruit? Grapefruit. Yes. Grapefruit? Oh, it's grapes. Lemon. <laughs> <laughs> so for Christine Page, two weeks of lessons from Alliance Francaise. Come and see me. Two weeks of intensive French lessons. Now Bloom is more about making friends, making personal contacts. You can get the information if you go onto the internet now, but there's no substitute for face-to-face -face contact, and that's really what Bloom is about now. When you're new and you need, you know, you need a community and this can be somebody's home. This can be not only just your church home, you know, but your, your community and kind of your home base. No, it's not strange that it takes place in a church. The American Church of Paris was built as a community center. And you have to remember that. Um, it's not just a church. When this church was first built, it had a bowling alley. It's still got a gymnasium, it's got a theatre, it's a community centre. Twelve-year-olds need to move their bodies around and need physical activity. And so sometimes that means having fun and just having a games day or a games night where they can run around and get out all of that excess energy. The youth program is interesting because we have students from, one parent is American or British and the other parent is French. Um, we have some students, mother is from Peru, whose father is from Sweden, but they were born in the United States and now they live in France. She's English and part Mexican. Yeah. And um, I have friends from Iceland and I have another friend from the States. And we have students who are uh, refugees or seeking asylum uh, from the various uh, political skirmishes and civil wars that are happening around the world. First when I arrived, I felt lost because I didn't speak uh, French. So I, I, had to, I had to learn French. But first of all, since, since here I could speak English, I could at least make some friends here. It's fun because you don't just come and sit down and learn, you actually do things. Sin is kind of like dodgeball. Sometimes other people do things that hurt us and some we get bloody noses or we get our glasses broken or we get hit in the ear. But sometimes in life, things just hit us like the balls in the game. And that's what happens with sin. And just, we just get dirty with sin. I'm interested and concerned with allowing these kids to see that God is not just a good idea, but God is a real tangible reality in our everyday life. During your teenage years, there, could, there can be so many things attracting you, telling you that Christianism is not that cool, such a cool thing. And he helped me out with that. I mean, he just, he just helped me to understand that you could be a young, a young child, a woman, <laughs> and, and be a Christian and, and not be uncool. <laughs> Some of the youth who will come by and talk to me about their, their difficulties with church. They grew up in a setting where 
church was always a guilt-ridden or a negative influence upon their life, or they grew up in places where the people and the leadership in the church uh, were oppressive or abusive. And one of the things that I can do for students is allow them, first allow them a space to question. Thank you for that. Okay, so this is birthday month. One, two, three. This is your birthday song. It doesn't last too long. I found myself in the middle of a winter, cold outside, um, deprived, um, a destitute, um, depressed from uh, running uh, and investing in the stock markets to being on the street without uh, a hope, without anything in France. It was really, really uh, a difficult thing for somebody who could not speak the language because I could not speak French. It's like you are blind. Do you understand what it is? It's, you know, no matter uh, how much education you have and when you are in a place where you cannot um, read the signs, you cannot speak the language, you are dead. You are a dead man. I had to sleep on, on the street for like a month because um, I didn't know anybody in France. I had no family here. At night, I have to look for a place to sleep. The fact is that when you are depressed, hunger really uh, leaves you. You are not really thinking about hunger. Maybe you are really thinking you're going to die. Maybe you're going to die. So you're, you're, you are thinking of, how am I going to get out of this deep shit? My first day at the American Church in Paris, I still remember very well. I came into the church and right at the door, I was received by Pastor Rogers. The way he just shook my hand it was as if that we've been friends for a long time. Uh, I just cracked up and um, I told him my story and um, we went into an office and I told him everything. He felt very, very sorry as much as he could not help on. Uh, for the first time, he was the first person to hear me out. <laughs> you know, you've been this in the week of, okay, battling and struggling out in the world there, but there was only one Sunday. It was my only day, my only and only day uh, of happiness, which I wouldn't let anybody rob me of. <laughs> And that was my Sunday at the American Church. So I got involved and uh, I was very happy doing that. We have a number of people who come to this church who have been caught in the crossfire of violence in civil wars within their countries. Some people have witnessed unspeakable crimes committed against family members and friends. Some people have been caught in what has been termed genocide as family members have been killed before their eyes. And when they come here, it's our hope that this place will be an opportunity for healing. Okay. How do you tell someone that you still have eight years of hell to go through? Okay? It's not human. No one can hope that I can say that and ha make the person happy. So I need to go beyond that. 
un pax, en fait, c'est comme un mariage. Ça veut dire qu'effectivement, il faut euh, prouver une vie ensemble pour pouvoir obtenir la carte de séjour. A lot of the people who come and seek advice here come either because they don't have legal status in France or they have problems that are related to the fact that they are foreigners, uh, either because they are taking advantage as tenants, they are being taken advantage as uh, an employee, or simply in a relationship. Donc, cette solution-là me paraît complètement aberrante de ce point de vue-là. Il faut donc surtout revenir, surtout par rapport à la carte de séjour. I practice people, lawyers practice law, <laughs> which is one way of saying that my uh, professional life is to help and assist foreigners in France, and I make a living out of it. But again, it's a direct link between what I do at the church and what I do in my office. Simply in one, I do it for the Lord, and for the other, I do it as a mean to make a living. We have a social concern committee, within we have Habitat for Humanity, and we also have the Refugee Committee. So I'm just one of a team of several people. Ça veut dire que après les dix ans, faut aussi prouver que vous êtes capable de gagner le SMIC, c'est-à-dire à peu près 1000 euros par mois en restant clandestine. In a clandestine in a country, I don't care which country it is, it is always hell. It is not something that you live easily because you're constantly on your guard checking where is the policeman, who is checking my uh, ticket in the metro, and uh, is my employer going to pay me? Because as an illegal person, I've got no recourse in court. So it is a constant worry, not to say that they usually don't have enough money to live in decent conditions. I don't know how many people have visited where they live. It's atrocious. It's absolutely atrocious. So if you can tell them that there is hope beyond that, I think we've done a great job. I was alone in my, uh, my room. I have no opportunity to meet anybody because uh, everybody speaks French, I can't speak French. We organize a Sri Lankan group for the, our language. They ask the pastor and then they ask, ask the pastor to uh, give you a room to worship here. <laughs> It's not for because everybody's like a friends, they and shake with family. their hand, just yeah. a family, just a family, they are, able, they are glad to meet ma them. They trust me and they give uh, the key and it, like my, like my house. children, if they didn't come to this church, uh, before we lived in Versailles in a very nice, a nice white suburb that was, you know, everyone pretty much looked the same, they would not have seen the diversity that they saw here. And for me, it is absolutely crucial for their worldview. Um, I come from a, a traditional Roman Catholic family, uh, and then I met my wife Martha in the in the States and she's from a, a pastor's family. Martha and I speak French together because we met in French 
uh, I speak French to the children unless there's someone around who doesn't understand French. And sometimes we, speak, we switch to German uh, when we don't want the kids to understand something. It's very, very practical. <laughs> On vacation in France, uh, our children, you know, they, if they have to do that thing little kids do after they drink too much lemonade, they go to the nearest bush. And the first time that we came to the States after Mark was potty trained, we went to Grand Island, New York, manicured lawns, neighbors, neighbors, manicured lawns. And I don't remember which neighbor saw it, but suddenly I saw Mark's bottom. And he was watering the neighbor's bush. And, and mom saw it and, and Mark just looked at me, but, but mommy, I, I, I the first multicultural couples dinner was called by Pastor Tina and I think there were six of us that attended and it was a wonderful time to talk about the things that we have in common, the, the hurdles that we have overcome as, uh, as multicultural couples and we all agreed we have, to, we have to do more with this. There's so many couples like this in the church. We ended up in Saint-Tropez and it was a hot day so I decided it was time to go to the beach and we decided okay in order not to uh, Frighten too many people, we better change in the car. Very right, discreet. Right on the beach, <laughs> I see Murray going boom to the sun, you know, like flat on the sun. And I said, What's wrong? She says, Look around. <laughs> Nobody wear anything. <laughs> <laughs> the difficulties in a multicultural couple, we over these few years that we've been in the group, we we understand also many of the problems are the same as regular couples. It's just that they can be exacerbated by the fact that we may not share a language, that we may not share um, the same religious history. But in the end, we've discovered a lot of it is about just learning how to communicate within a couple and that that's been a good learning thing. Share our experiences. We pray your blessing on our time together. And things came up that made people cry. Things came up where you realize the spouse was touched. What, the other spouse was saying and I thought wow without without this place this church to bring people there we wouldn't have had that exchange it is volunteer work it's all volunteer work and I would say that it's it, it can be really frustrating sometimes because there are people from all different walks of life you can't just send one simple email because not everyone has email there are, um, and people come and go. It's difficult. There are about 50 volunteers, and it's, but it's a joy, and it's, and it's for a good, it's for a very good cause. All the committees are, are run by volunteer people. Uh, you are people that come here uh, nearly every day to help with anything. You have people taking care of this magnificent building who are giving hours and hours and hours uh, per week. Whether it's the music program, whether it's the church council, Sunday school teachers, those who clean up after fellowship activities or serve coffee or greet people on Sunday morning or serve as ushers, in all those various dimensions of church life, without the people, we have no church. One of the challenges at the American church is having part of its community be so transient. People are here for three months or six months or a year, we have people who have been here for 30 years, and that's fantastic, but it's how do we involve the newcomers in a vital way? How do we continue to keep the old pillars of the church involved and not allow 10% of the people to do 90% of the work? The congregation gives what might be called derivative power to the, the church council that's elected by the members of our church. And our church council m makes many of the decisions that are important for the ongoing functioning of the church. The ventilation aspect of the project, which involves the renovation of the heating of the sanctuary itself. We meet, the council meets once a month, every third Tuesday of the month and that's where all uh, the proposals are brought up and discussed. 
and uh, we take a vote. So have we made any big decisions? <laughs> it's a very democratic approach to decision making. Any major expenditure, the annual budget, uh, any large change in, in programming approach, things like that are all brought before the council. Um, usually a committee presents whatever and makes recommendations. We have discussion. We all have ample opportunity to make whatever comments we have, objections or, or support. It's also scary because you're making decisions uh, for, for, for the congregation. Want to express the care and the love of Christ to those whom we know. Amen. Amen. It is easy to say, you're my brother in Christ or you're my sister in Christ. It's easy to say it. But when someone has habits or have customs that gets on your nerves so bad that you almost want to strangle the person, that's where the human factor comes into effect in our community. And we really need to make sure that we have the ways and the means to diffuse those tensions before they arise and creates problems. Some cultures in our church are patriarchal, and some cultures in our church are matriarchal. And so when you have the women from the matriarchal society asking the men in the patriarchal society to do something, there's this sense of, why are you, why are you asking me to do that? You need to have your, your men come to me. I'd say it's not unexpected to, that there be some uh, misunderstanding or maybe even to some, to some degree tensions because um, different cultures have their own way of living and believing. So, but in this church, we, I think we try our best to understand each other and uh, make way for each other. think, well, these Japanese people coming over here for an American wedding, or a Western wedding at least, uh, with a translator, that it would be kind of mechanical. But I find they, they really take it seriously. It's a very special moment for them. We gather in the presence of God to witness the joining together of Eiko and Satoko in marriage. Probably close to 75% of the weddings that I've done are Japanese weddings, and of course they are bilingual. As a church where we have uh, blessings of marriages, we also derive a certain amount of, of income from marriages or wedding vow renewals. Catherine, veux-tu prendre Laurent pour époux et vivre avec lui avec, dans l'alliance du mariage? Je le veux. As a community center um, and as a place where we host a number of different groups for multiple purposes, we receive different uh, income for the usage of our facilities, people that make donations to uh, help offset the cost of utilities and other things that are a part of, of running the building every day. The biggest challenge in the future facing the American church in Paris is, I think, financial. Uh, this is a big building. Uh, we have fewer Americans with high incomes. The Americans who come are middle management as opposed to in the old days when I was here in the 70s, they were the CEOs that were rewarded after 25 years of service with a post in Paris and their children were grown, they had extra money, they had a trailing spouse who could give volunteer time. We have an increasing number of immigrant groups, which is wonderful, they all tithe, they give 10% of the, what they have, but what they have is not very big. So really getting this building financially settled and stable would be a big priority so that we can continue to do all these wonderful ministries that don't bring us all that much income. They bring us a lot of goodwill 
and they um, bring us um, wonderful people. Hi, my name is John. I'm an alcoholic, and uh, this is uh, in the library of the American Church here in Paris. It's the first meeting in Paris that I came to was in this very room many years ago, and it's uh, home to many meetings. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are other meetings in other rooms in the church too, and there are other programs that meet here. There are many 12-step programs. There's Debtors Anonymous and uh, Gamblers Anonymous and. Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. One of the things that AA has given me, uh, and many of us, I know this, I, we share about it all the time, that we belong again in community, which we didn't. And it is definitely enhanced by the relationship with the American church. received here as family members and we feel it and we welcome it. We all know Keith at the front desk. Um, we know the other people around. We've gotten to, many of us go to hear the concerts in the church or the performances that they have here. So we feel a very much a part of it in, uh, in ways above and beyond our meetings. And we're aware this room is a, uh, where we're sitting is part of the Montessori school. Uh, there are other groups that use it as well. There's a dance class that follows us after one meeting, so we're aware of a lot of our, in, our interrelationships with them. And in other places, that isn't so. We come in, we have the meeting, and we leave, and we lock up, and that's it. It's a very interesting international place to, to experience with activities from karate to tai chi to aerobics to ballet to Bible study to 12-step groups to everything happening all around you to people coming in the door desperate, they've, they've had their passports stolen to people who are here, musicians, and they're studying, they're looking for a place to practice, or I mean, you name it, and it comes through the door. I've actually known about the American Church for a very long time. I knew it was also an international center where students could find where it was, uh, you know, part-time jobs or housing, and I knew it was a center, kind of an international center. I would say that it is a, it's probably a combination of a church and a community center. It was actually, actually certainly designed that way. The original structure had bowling alleys in the basement. The, the library was a, a study center for students. Uh, the Thurber room was, was for the Ladies Benevolent Society to, to make bandages and things to be sent off to the, the soldiers. And uh, they had dances here, they had jazz ensembles, they had, during the war, they had cots in, in this, this room right here where the soldiers could stay overnight in Paris. I think sometimes a lot of it has to do with the historical roots. You know, the American Church of Paris has been here for 150 years. It's just, it's become so much of the fabric of Paris itself. C'est le chiffre qu'on redoutait. On compte ce soir 4857 morts ou disparus sous les décombres encore fumants du World Trade Center à New York. À Paris, ce soir, une cérémonie œcuménique était organisée à l'église américaine en présence des représentants des principales religions. There was a service, an interfaith service that was held here a few days after 9/11. And there were a number of dignitaries and officials from the French government 
um, from the American government and of course representatives from many different world religions who were here. That was a very special event and, and we were privileged to be able to host it. Si les cœurs des hommes ne changent pas, alors le monde est condamné et livré au pire de ce qu'il peut inventer. The American Church in Paris represented a little piece of the United States of America and this is where people thought of this is our way to express to all of America by coming here to uh, Quai d'Orsay. We at the embassy are normally restricted in our assistance to helping uh, Americans with a uh, official document like a passport or a birth report or helping them with financial assistance if they need to get back to the United States. So in the area of counseling or trying to provide an outlet for people to offer assistance, we will say try the American church in Paris. The American Church in Paris has received several of what are called the Silver Medal of Paris, which is given to organizations who help uh, in a community way uh, that are not strictly limiting their uh, uh, responsibilities to religious affairs, but in fact using the church as a community center. Uh, I know the American Church has uh, uh, several clubs that come there. Fellowship meets every Sunday. We eat a lot, we laugh a lot, we sing a lot, we dance a lot. They help each other. If somebody needs a job, they tell each other. If anyone knows of a job, please, this, this and that person needs a job. Being together for us means a, a great deal lot. Uh, these are people who these are people who are away from their families, who have been away from their families for so long. And when we're together, it's almost like being with your family. We're, we're the family that, uh, that, that they left behind. When you're a foreigner in a foreign land, you're very vulnerable and to have a place that you're safe. This is a safe place. This is where you can come. And, but it's not just the Americans that, you're, that, you're, that are making you safe. It's all these people that are coming together, living in another country, and dealing with the, the issues that that deals with, that, that support each other and help each other. And that's very important what the American church is. Some people might think that church is taking too much of a role, it's, it's branching out too much. I don't agree with that. I, I see a real need uh, for many people to have a place where they can connect, where they can be welcome and loved, no matter their situation, no matter their origin. And we live in such a harsh world that there's really a need for that. I think these lunches help the homeless people not just in feeding them physically but also feeding them 
emotionally and hopefully spiritually as well. Because I think a lot of times when people are in that kind of position, they lose respect for themselves and confidence. And so we don't treat them like, you know, we're doing them a favor because we love doing it and we're all the same really. It doesn't matter if you have more or less, we're all, God loves all of us. Okay. Is it good? Oh, thank you. It's delicious. And it works great every week. Everybody gets fed. <laughs> My impression is that the, the future of the church is going to be even, it'll be even more of a mission church than it is, than it is now. It's, it's interesting that the American church sits in a, an extremely wealthy part of Paris, yet it ministers to, to the, really to the non-wealthy, to those, you know, a lot of immigrants come here. Uh, there's really a lot of mission work to be done in Paris that, that most people don't realize. You usually see a picture of the American church from the, the Alexander III bridge with the Eiffel Tower behind it and everything looks wonderful and, and wealthy, but, but in reality there's this whole sub, subculture that, with all these needs at the, the church services and I think that's going to become even more intense as the, as the years go on. Probably that is, that is going to be the, the main mission of the church. To confirm it has lifted my sorrows and because of it there's a tomorrow made me realize what's fun to make so when things go wrong she will not accept it said go my son into the world go to my people and preach the gospel there'll be no harm there'll be no more sorrow so what we gonna do is to praise the Lord and pray Dieu nous te sommes très reconnaissants Merci, merci pour tout, pour ton amour Comment pourrions-nous te remercier Tu es merveilleux, tu es bon Dieu nous te sommes très reconnaissants Merci, merci pour tout, pour ton amour Comment Singing is just, it's a wonderful thing for me I mean, it's, I sing all the time, <laughs> all the time and I even think my mom is tired of it sometimes, but... And, and I discovered that thanks to this church. And when I met Bunny Woolley, one day she just said, Fernand, would you like to try a solo? And I was like, me? <laughs> Are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> and so I did. I did. And somehow she heard something else, something I had never heard. And she thought, you know, maybe you should sing more and more solos, you know? <laughs> So when I sing in church um, a song about Jesus Christ and God's love, and that people come to me and say, man, we were so touched by this song. I just feel like, wow, I've done my work. You know, I've been able to touch people through this song and, and God's been able to touch them through my song. He's worked for them through me. I mean, my friend Linda is, um, is Muslim and we met in school and, and for some kind of party at school we had to sing together and, and she, she was wondering where I learned to sing and I told her that I learned to sing in the American church. I said, you know, maybe you should come one day and, you know, just come and see and if you want to sing with us then I'm sure that Bunny Wooling, which is our choir director, would be happy to have you. When, when I first learned that she was Muslim, my first reaction was, yes, 
I have to say, um, because one of the things that I fight for in my work with kids and my work with adults and in myself and is, is openness, is, is communication, is learning to accept other people's realities as being valuable and valid. And it's one of the messages that I try to, to, to send to the kids is that nobody is better than anybody else. We're different. And I can't judge anybody else for choosing a different path to God. I can't, I can't judge somebody for choosing a different lifestyle, a different... Listen, there's one thing that's important, and that's, that's, that's love, okay? That's, that's respect. It's, the, it's, it's, it's light. And if that light is there, Muslims, Christians, uh, Buddhists, we all, we all share that light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Occasionally, families will, will come to the church, bring their kids to the church to participate in the music program, but uh, almost as if it were some kind of a free music center for the kids to come and learn and sing and, and have a good time, which is uh, learning and singing and having a good time is, is what we are there for, yes. But um, it's very unfortunate when people don't either don't see or don't want to see or participate in the spiritual aspects of what goes on at the American church. And it, it is a church. Being part of a musical ensemble is, is, a, is a great introduction uh, to a church or to a community because you, you become part of a fellowship, you're creating something that's, that's bigger than yourself. Often a choir is made up of people with not extraordinary voices, but the combination turns into something wonderful. Occasionally there will be people who will come into the choir who have, who have no religious background, who really have no, no faith, so to speak, but they're, but they're attracted by the music. Um, I welcome them in wholeheartedly because oftentimes they do catch the spirit, and I have seen it happen, that, that people will be, you know, slowly they'll be watching other people, what they're doing, how they're acting, they'll, they'll catch this the spirit of, you know, fellowship and, 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 and become involved. And, and some have eventually joined the church or, or you know, gone on to have other kinds of, you know, exper religious experiences, but it does happen. Music has a way of touching people that, that even words can't. It, it gets to a certain place. Uh, it's the reason I'm in music, because mu music touches me in a special way. 
and, and we find that in the congregation that the music is tremendously meaningful. It's very important to them. They get, because of the different denominational backgrounds and cultural backgrounds, we do all kinds of music to, to try and touch all of the people. Hearing the music always makes me cry on Easter because there's something, I, I do think God uses music to, to sneak into your heart in ways that words don't do. Music goes right to your heart very quickly. One thing people, when they go back to their home country, to their home churches, one thing they, they say to us is that they never realized how how uniform their churches are, they tend to find themselves among people from the same socioeconomic class. We're here, they're with all kinds of denominations, all kinds of economic situations. It's, it is like the United Nations. It is like a, this mixture of you know God's total creation. It's all here on a Sunday morning or during the week, walking in and out of the doors. The American Church in Paris is an interdenominational church, so we have people here from pretty much every Christian denomination you can think of. Um, Catholics, uh, Baptists, Methodists, uh, Presbyterians, Anglicans. In France it's very interesting because there's so few Protestants and the Reformed Church of France has women pastors. But I find that most people have never met a woman pastor. Sometimes people see us as mom and dad, I think. One Sunday last year when both Barry and I were gone, I came back and ha had people say, we felt like we were abandoned. Neither you nor Barry were there. And it was like mom and dad had left. <laughs> sort of fun. When they say ACP, which is American Church Paris, to me that that always stands for active Christian people, because that's kind of what we are, Christians, people trying to act like Christ through actions. There's something particular in the American church that just makes that people just want to be here. It's, it's the central part of, of our family life, and I, 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 I need this place. <laughs> I never had the sense of fulfillment that I get here. I know we're doing good things here. The heights of human joy and the depths of human sorrow, being able to share that with one another is, helps us to be more human. In this world, you can feel so lonely sometimes, and you, then you come to this church and you see so many people from everywhere, and you, then you just feel like home. I mean, for me, the American church is like home. Being the American church and having that kind of constituency maybe would remind the United States that this country was created and grew as a melting pot. I have a sincere hope that one day my grandchildren or my great-grandchildren will go into this church and will we'll say this is the church that my grandparents and my great-grandparents worshipped in when they lived in Paris. It really is a microcosm 
of the global church of Jesus Christ. Some people will probably have to wait until they get to heaven to be able to see such a, a rainbow of races, but we get that glimpse of heaven every week.